Hello. Negative karma is a poison of the mind. Fighting anger with anger is like following a lunatic who jumps off a cliff. The tangible lacks solidity. It's an illusion, and only through meditation can we become familiar with other ways of being. Tonight, Tibetan Buddhism. <laughs> My name is Parvi Wong Jirachai. I'm a newspaper columnist from Thailand. For me, Tibetan Buddhism is a bit like going to Disneyland. You're put on a roller coaster ride through fantasy land, only to rediscover how you've created fantasy in your own life and the world. My name is Annie Chudron. I come from Sussex, and I was ordained as a Tibetan Buddhist nun in Samya Ling Monastery, Scotland. Hello, my name is Charles Manson. I've been interested in Tibetan Buddhism since the early 70s. I was a monk for eight years and did retreat for eight years as well. Hello, I'm Norma Levine. I write books about Buddhism and import Buddhist meditation artifacts from India and Nepal. I've been practicing Tibetan Buddhism for over 20 years. Hello, I'm Annie Yeshi Palmo. I'm from Triangle House Buddhist Centre in Oxford. I've been um, a Buddhist for 13 years and I've been practicing as a nun for the last 11. Hello, my name's John Renshaw. I've been practicing Tibetan Buddhism for about 16 years and I practice uh, complementary medicine. I teach Tibetan yoga and I produce music. Now, Children, you had a very different um, life before you became a Buddhist. You, you, you were a presenter of um, Top Gear, which to me it, it is, is, is extraordinary because um, I, I kind of think of, in possibly very simplistic terms, of Top Gear and Jeremy Clarkson as being something of the antithesis to uh, Tibetan Buddhism. I mean, am I, am I right or wrong in saying that? Um, I suppose uh, if I think about that, period of my life, um, I'd relate it to the kind of an 80s sort of lifestyle that's more concerned with, you know, outward things, outward appearance, searching for happiness through a fast car or a bigger house or something like that, which doesn't actually bring you happiness because happiness is a state of mind. So uh, it's quite easy in a way to make a change. If you look at maybe, you know, all our lifestyles, there's that kind, there could be that theme running through it that initially it starts off with less wisdom and a kind of search outside yourself for happiness and then at some point you realize it's not out there um, it's somewhere else so when you were working on the program did you find yourself becoming increasingly dissatisfied with the message that Top Gear was giving the people of Britain? Um, I don't think I really looked at it like that. I do remember uh, asking if we could do some more environmental pieces and the director looking at me and saying, but it's, you know, it's a program about fast cars. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there was a slight awareness of um, maybe this isn't something um, I want to be involved in all the way through the 1990s as well. So I went travelling to the east looking for some answers I suppose but was uh, there were a lot of Tibetan Buddhist monks in um, Nepal uh, obviously um, and I just kind of liked the look of them and ended up following <laughs> following a few of them around just wandering behind them in the street thinking this is nice I like this at about the time that I went to Nepal there was an enthronement happening in Tibet um, of a um, well, His Holiness, the 17th Karmapa, which I knew nothing about except that having had this, this dinner at the, end of, uh, at the end of the meal, this person presented me with a photograph, um, which you could say, and in one sense is, a photograph of uh, a young Tibetan boy. But, I mean, I can't explain it really, but it, there was something in his face or in his eyes that 
made me think this person carries the wisdom that I've been looking for. Then you came back to Britain. Uh, yes. Somebody said you should go to this Tibetan Buddhist monastery in Scotland, um, which I think I'd heard about while I was travelling. Um, so I went there waving my photograph around and uh, Lama Yeshi, who's the abbot there, um, looked at the photograph and said, oh yes, my brother's in Tibet with him now. So it was just a boy in a photograph. There was, I mean, what, where was he standing? What? Uh, just his face. So just a close-up of his face. And so you took the photograph up to Scotland and, and he said, oh, I know him. Yeah, well, then it turned out that here, this particular Lama's the supreme head of the Kaju lineage, um, which the monastery in Scotland is a part of. Um, Just absolute so, coincidence. So, Although you well, would say that there is no such thing. But it was a joy to find people, because I'd been showing everybody in my family and they'd been looking at me thinking, <laughs> you know, he's a boy. They so, didn't think anything special? When you some showed. friends did, yeah. actually. Some people, I noticed, they mm. put the photograph quite high on their mantelpieces. And but, you, but you only had one copy, so what, they put it on the no, mantelpiece? I laser copied them. I, laser, I spent about £100. Uh -huh. laser, <laughs> I, I laminated them so they this wouldn't get amazing. damaged. <laughs> yeah. 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 To, to hand them around? I mean, did to you give think, them to my friends. Right. Not to sort of put them up and say, has anybody seen this boy? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so it was very nice to then go to a community where um, everybody regarded him with the same kind of... Um, feeling really. So was it after that year that you went to meet him? Uh, sometime two or three years later, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was that like? Um, well, I think I'd set myself up for a fool, really. <laughs> um, a lot of expectation. I've uh, a very kind of grasping mind, you know, you kind of want something from somebody and they're, um, you know, if they're very good teachers, they don't give you what you think you want, they give you what you need. So, um, you know, he wasn't likely to say, hello, children, <laughs> long time, no see. So I suppose in that sense, there's a, a, a teaching in it. Um, so the day you met him, and I'm sorry to keep going on, you see, this yeah, is my <laughs> grasp of mind wanting something from yeah. you, which is this story, and I apologize. But so, so, so the day you met him, what happened? You, you knew you were gonna meet him that day. Um, yeah, m maybe, uh, how can you describe this kind of, um, what kind of moves around the atmosphere when, uh, when there's a teacher? I mean, everybody here would, would understand that feeling of when you're coming into contact with your teacher. It isn't just his mm. physical presence. Way before that, the days before it, the pilgrimage before it, if that's what's there. All the activity that goes around arranging the visits, it's... It's a casino. There's a, there's a phenomenal movement of something. Yeah. It's a mandala. There's a lot of projection yeah. though, involved as well. <laughs> it's a mandala, yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah. There's a lot of activity, but from both ways, isn't there? It's ordinary magic. Mm. It's very ordinary, because mm. you can't quite put mm. your finger on it. Mm. But it's very magical, in another sense. Mm. I don't know if that's your experience. It's like entering a mandala. You're entering mm. a sacred place. You're entering a, another environment where almost um, things happen spontaneously, as if by magic. But it's, very, it's on a very, very ordinary level. But that's what I was going to say. I, I kept on wanting to say that, in fact, Top Gear is not that different from Tantra. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Fast cars, mm. doing TV programs. You know, uh. you're, you're creating vision, you're creating fantasies, you're creating... Mm. And in that process, you realize how you, how we all create our own fantasies of our life, of the world. So I was going to say that probably your, your experience as a journalist was good fuel. very helpful. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's a good point. We got to the part of the story where you'd met him, but what, what were the first words he, he said to you the first time you met him? He didn't say anything because I don't speak uh, Tibetan and he doesn't speak English. Um, so we just... This... Um, voice is one form of communication. I mean, maybe in a very simple way, you'd, uh, it would be understandable from the point of view of a, a parent that cares about their child. I mean, they say that about the, the guru's role, or, or lama, as the Tibetan word for guru. Lama is the ma is to do with mother. 
So there's this caring quality and a non-exploitation that a, a parent would have for their child. Mm -hmm. And if you think about maybe how the child would feel towards the parent, that parent can, with a look, teach the child more than sitting down and saying, OK. Mm -hmm. um, so a look is, can carry as, as much as anything. Um, and then if you say to the child, can you explain the, exactly what your parent meant when they looked at you like that, you, you can't and I can't. Um, but obviously this, this point of um, uh, a living teacher is really um, kind of the essence of Tibetan Buddhism as I understand it. Um, and I find it really helpful, the analogy of, uh, of the mirror, that if you want to see your own mind, to see the nature of your mind, it's a little bit, and you have to see that with your mind, it's a little bit like your eyes wanting to see your own eyes. You can't unless you use a mirror. You, your eyes see everything but themselves, um, and the same thing. So they say that, that the llama's like a, like a mirror. And in that sense, they're completely stainless, they're completely free, they're completely uh, clear of, you know, it's only your projection going backwards and forwards. Mm. So the thing about not having the, not having the mm. ego, they just reflect to you what you need to see. And sometimes, like when you look in a mirror, it's not very pleasant. It's very difficult. I, I think in mm. initial stages, you don't know. You might be more confused and think you know, but that's pr probably a, a learning curve. Mm -hmm. um, it, that's why it's important to have a teacher or a groom. And the mirror, the mirror is a big feature. And um, you might come after doing some practice or after a retreat, go to the teacher and or sit in front of the mirror, and it's like, you know, I wonder if he's going to recognise I've got some kind of development or realisation, and, and you'll get you know, what, what, what's due, really. Um, so you, you may be put down a peg or two and think, no, it's not, not the case. You're, uh, you haven't developed anything apart from an ego or a sore back or pain in the knee or something. You know, it, it's very difficult. But um, slowly, slowly, one, one makes progress. But after, it's only down to practice, really. Mm. So is and there uh, guilt if you found yourself being materialistic one day? Do you, do you feel, no, you feel no. terrible about it? No. No. There's no, no word for guilt in Tibetan, no, there's actually. No guilt. There's no word for guilt in Tibetan language. Mm. There's regret, and there's um, you know purification, yes. confession, so on. But um, guilt there's means kind of beating yourself up and feeling really bad about something you've done. But it's it's thought that if you recognize it and confess it, and then do uh, purification, try to remedy it, that's it. That's all you have to do. It's a karma. I mean, you, you, you've purified a karma, and um, there's no need to feel, you know, eternally guilty about something. Mm. Well, it comes from it's that the whole philosophy, doesn't it? Yeah. The whole it's, uh, it's really not a forever, important part no that we're essentially, we have Buddha nature. Yeah. So essentially, right. we're essentially sometimes pure anyway. we make a bit of a mess. So fine, yeah. you know, purify mm. and, and do what's necessary, and there are methods within our tradition, but then that's it. So to hold on to this feeling of, I'm bad or, you know, it's yeah. no good. This yeah. is um, sort of, actually, it comes into what's technically called lazy. Because you're, uh -huh. you're yeah. this right. feeling that right. I can't do it, or right. I'm, it, it comes under in the text. It's lack of confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Lack of confidence, yeah. lack of yeah. confidence yeah. and feeling bad and... Yeah. 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 The basic understanding in Buddhism is that you're inherently pure, yeah. primordially, primordially pure, and that um, you've kind of taken a wrong track. <laughs> And that's called ignorance, and uh, that is the nature of what's called samsara. But uh, it's not like your um, uh, ir original sin is not there. It's original purity. Really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's but this difference. is also something that Tibetan Buddhism emphasizes much more, because other traditions like they Theravada or Thai uh -huh. Buddhism, well, there is such a word as uh, shame, hiri otapa, mm. and. Um, there is in Tibetan, there is shame, there's notsar, which is shame. Not guilt. But not guilt. Not guilt. Mm. guilt. Now, I'm interested, we, we touched very briefly earlier on, on the, the notion of tangibility as being illusory. Um, and Norma, so did you uh, experience a, a dematerialization at one point? <laughs> <laughs> Are you what a there? question. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Star Trek, isn't it? <laughs> Beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> Would you like to rephrase that? <laughs> <laughs> um, a, vanish, a miraculous did you, phenomenon. Did you, did you have a <laughs> uh, Yes, I did. Uh, it happened on my first trip to India. 
and um, I had bought a Buddha statue in Delhi, which I kind of picked out from um, in a shop. It was a an old Buddha, and I um, then went to Dharamsala. And I, um, after about a week or so, I got a reply to a letter from uh, Akon Rinpoche in Scotland telling me that I should go and find Sita Rinpoche, who was living nearby, and ask him any Dharma questions that I needed to ask him. So um, I went immediately. Somehow this name was very kind of, mm. it rang bells for me. So he would, I, I take it he I'd he, never heard of him. What, what, what exactly is a Dharma question? Uh, questions about Buddhism, mm -hmm. things that I was kind of thinking about at the time. Mm -hmm. So I went off to find Sita Rinpoche and uh, just kind of found myself hours later in um, a Tibetan settlement. And I walked in and he was sitting there. So I gave him the Buddha statue and asked him to bless it. And I'd heard about this, you know, road to lay and I'd heard that it was extremely dangerous and um, lots of uh, buses crashed and it was you know I'm not I'm not big on altitudes I must say I have a little I have a little bit of uh, vertigo and uh, I wasn't looking forward to this but I decided that anyway I had to go I just had to go I had to go to a Buddhist country so I took the statue with me and I put it on top of you know, I had this kind of old army rucksack, and I put it inside the rucksack right on the very top, but it was covered, and I had wrapped it up in a cloth. Um, and uh, that was all I had, this little rucksack with a few clothes in it and a Buddha on top. Got on the bus, and after about a um, couple of hours, we had climbed up the first pass, uh, the Zojila Pass, I think it was called. It was about 16,000 feet. And suddenly the, you know, there was a convoy of buses because no bus ever went alone on this road. So the bus in front suddenly started to kind of zigzag across the road like that. And uh, it ended up crashing into the mountainside and turning over. And um, fortunately nobody was hurt, but um, the brakes had failed and um, that was the result. So uh, we got out and we had to spend the night on the road. And because of this, the next day there was um, uh, a kind of sense that we had to get there fast from some of the Kashmiri businessmen who were on the bus. So they were kind of encouraging the driver to go as fast as possible, and he was. He was lighting, he was, I, I'll never forget this, I was, sitting, I was sitting in the front seat, you know, there's just like one seat right at the front of the bus, and then there was the, um, um, the bus driver lighting up joints and kind of going faster and faster around these incredible hairpin bends. Mm. And I thought we were all going to die. I was, I was convinced we were going to crash and that uh, this was my time. That was it. So I was um, plugging into the Buddha as the only reference point that I had because I was absolutely terrified. And um, I was alone. Mm. So you weren't at this uh, point thinking of death as being a opportunity. No, not at all. <laughs> it was, it was uh, something I wanted to avoid with all my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't ready to die at all. I hadn't uh, come to terms with death whatsoever. And um, I had the Buddha with me and the memory of Thai Situ Rinpoche who had blessed it. But I was just like there with this Buddha. And anyway, it, it 10 o'clock at night came and we finally got down off the bus. We were all still there somehow. And uh, I'll never forget, I went into a little room with a kind of naked light bulb on the ceiling and opened up my rucksack to look at my Buddha. And uh, lo and behold, the cloth was there, but the statue was gone. So I immediately went into this kind of logical explanation that somebody had stolen it. I, um, it, was, it was impossible to think of anything else. But I couldn't work out how it had been done. Um, so the next day I asked the um, bus driver to stop and asked him if I could check everybody's luggage because my, my sacred object had been stolen, but this didn't go down well at all with the, uh, <laughs> the Indian um, tourists on the bus. They, they said, oh, you're accusing us of stealing. And I realized after 10 minutes of looking in luggage it was impossible, so I just let it go. I said, okay, it's gone. It's, um, that's it. Go with it, you know? So anyway, um, I 
few months later, found myself after this Ladakhi trip back in Srinagar, went to the post office, and there was a letter from um, Sita Rimshe saying, uh, sorry, I couldn't come. Um, couldn't get a visa, but uh, when you come back, uh, please come to Sherabling. You're welcome here. It's your home. So I went racing back to Sherabling, and uh, first thing I said to him was, um, my Buddha was stolen. He said, uh, I think it went back to its original home. And uh, I said, Dharmakaya. And he said, yes, uh, dematerialized dematerialize. It's uh, dharmakaya. So I then had this kind of, um, I said, oh, is that good or bad? I couldn't work out whether this was um, something that was desirable or not. And he said, oh, I think it's uh, good, very, very good. <laughs> Um, you, you come from a um, um, from from a from a Buddhist society, but not a Tibetan Buddhist society, mm. a Thai Buddhist society. Tell me, tell me about the differences. What what's <coughs> is is, to, is it? Would it be really bad for me to say that Tibetan Buddhism was better than other forms of Buddhism, or is that is it okay to say that? <laughs> 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 it's more complex, mm. and I think uh, I remember one of my teachers saying to one of his students who was saying, why do I have to do these complex tantric visualizations with 11 heads, you know, 30 arms and different colors? And why can't I just do a simple meditation? He said, well, because you're very complicated, aren't you? So is Tibetan Buddhism more fun? Is more fun, much more fun. <laughs> much more fun. Um, I think that's, that's the influence of Tantra. I think many of you will agree with mm. me here. Yeah. Um, and even the whole attitude that I think Norma was talking about of being, um, you know, no, there's no sense of, less of a sense of guilt and all that, um, is an influence of Tantra, this, this feeling that everything in your life, every part of your experience is to be brought to the path. Whereas I think in Theravada, in Thai Buddhism, the divide is much greater still. Mm. Except in some traditions, I mean in vipassana, but then most of, most people don't practice vipassana. You have to understand that in Thailand, most people are, have a devotional uh, relationship with religion, with Buddhism, and there is a very much a strong divide between the monks, uh, a greater divide anyway than in Tibetan Buddhism between the monks and the lay people. I want to know your story. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen you walking about Sammy Ling and I'd like to know. I thought, oh good, Charles is coming. <laughs> so what's your story, Charles? Gosh. How did you get into this? Um, from the beginning. Well, just being uh, an inquirer as well. Um, brought up in a Christian tradition. Um, ordained, uh, not ordained, sorry, confirmed as a um, Christian used to go to communion quite a bit um, in the 60s, you know, making that effort of going almost every day at, at one time, um, reading a certain amount, and, but not finding explanations at all. You know, um, I think if I'd met a, a really good Christian teacher at that time, I might have stayed with it, um, but I didn't. And gradually you come across a few books, you meet some people, um, went to Samuel Ling, and it was a gradual process. Um, I think quite a strong confirmation of it was in 74, um, meeting the, the previous Kamapa, um, the 16th Kamapa, um, the previous incarnation of, of the boy. That, uh, oh, was the same about. boy? Yes. No, um, it was a but previous life. But he was in his yeah. pre previous life. Uh, he was, what, 56 at the time. And let me just, before you go on, let me just mm. clarify, the, um, we know who's a previous incarnation because before he passed on he mm. said this is how I will this well, is my new yes. incarnation what well, literally he'll be found in this he village right on this down. street and right gave it to the yeah. teacher that Norma was talking was about, about yeah. uh -huh. wrote it down in a kind of um, almost like a riddle you could say to the north 
I mean, do you remember it? I mean, in the land of the, the thundering, thunder and cow and something <laughs> like that. It's that kind of thing which has to be interpreted, you know, in the year of the wood ox, uh -huh. um, the sound of the uh, conch, great white one. Yeah. The great white one will be heard in the skies, and he sort of gave a riddle which tied up with an actual location and a family, and and it was a nomad tent actually. And all these um, things happened uh, according to the letter. Hmm. So well, that's how. Anyway, that was. <coughs> yes. A digression. <coughs> Carry on. And and from there it was um, just uh, a, a, gr a gradual learning process of um, uh, meeting teachers, taking teaching, and being quite um, diligent about that. I suppose at one time. Um, my partner died in um, 1980, uh, I had a small child as well at the time, um, and I became a monk at that time and then prepared to go into retreat. It took about four years of preparation. Um, then went into retreat um, with seven other men. Um, there were nine women, but completely separate, of course. Um, that was for four years. Um, and then there was a break of about a year um, and then did another four years uh, again with more men and more women and, it was and since that sort of goes up to 93 I suppose um, since then um, um, did some more re retreats um, but I just finished the second lot of um, four years and uh, it's quite a problem you know to know what to do <laughs> when you've been in retreat for four years, yeah. missed out on the 80s sort of thing. Um, well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good time. Yeah. <laughs> didn't know that Thatcher had gone for quite a while. I just, um, yeah, didn't yeah. know that for ages, a yeah. year or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gulf War. Really, you knew yeah. nothing. Really yeah. Yeah. Then, you, you tended to learn things well. like Chernobyl. We were drinking the milk <laughs> from the cows, didn't know anything about it. Um, because at that particular time you weren't talking for about six months or so, um, but you, t you found these things out later, um, either through you know letters from people, or from the people um, helping you with the retreat, bringing in the food or whatever. Or blowing in the dark. Mm. Yeah. And have all yeah. of you been on retreat? I yeah, I guess short so. Ones, not yeah, not, yeah. not major. Yeah. Mm. But you you were on a long retreat also. I, yeah, I did. Um, um, like Charles, I did a four-year retreat. I did the second one. So what happened? Can you can you can you talk me through? Uh, I know that there's some things that occur in retreats which you don't want to talk about, but um, um, what goes on internally? But I'm really interested in what actually goes on externally in a in a retreat. What 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 do you do? You mean your day? Yeah. Mm. Timetable. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, get up at four. Uh, two hours of prayers, well, a bit before four, to start at four. Uh, two hours of prayers, um, then uh, prayers together for about half an hour. Um, then breakfast, short break, you know, get cleaned up or whatever. And then a three-hour session, uh, sort of morning. Um, then lunch, then another um, three-hour session in the afternoon. And um, that's individually in your rooms. Um, <clears throat> and then a, a, a service together for about an hour, an hour and a half. Um, and then a, a, another sort of evening break, soup, tea, whatever. And um, then another three hour session in the evening. You were only once having a didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> this this, this, is, less, this is sitting in a box. Um, <laughs> you actually have a physical box to, to sit in because it sort of helps contain your energy. Uh, and you sleep in the box? Yeah. Very yeah. nice. I have to say, it's very nice box. Yes. <laughs> when you say box, you think like Sainsbury's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> something like no, that. They're nice but they're very box. nice, you know, it's like <laughs> maybe three quarters of this table. <laughs> Then it has a nice back and side. Yeah. Well, um, so um, um, beautifully, you know, carved just, wood, just the and then with a cushion, mm. you sitting know, that you up, sit right? on. You yeah. sleep sitting up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've you got sides for four so, years. You try. Is this? Yeah. But you're probably wondering what happens in a session. 
Uh -huh. I'm, 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 I'm still visualising the box before <laughs> the we, box, we get to <laughs> <this>. <laughs> move on to the session. Yeah. Well, okay. um, sorry, I didn't quite finish. The, the okay. evening session was three hours, and then there was another one of about an hour of um, sort of slightly musical uh, chanting session, but mm. in your own rooms, mm -hmm. known as the church. And um, uh, you're finishing prayers, and you finish about 11 or so, and then back up again at 4. Now, I've got to say, if you just go through one night of not sleeping that well, you, you find mm. yourself with a slightly altered reality the next mm. day. So <laughs> four years of this, yeah. things... It takes a bit of time to get used to, maybe a couple of months or so. Um, mm. And then I remember at one point um, I had some ache or pain and the caretaker of the retreat, he was good at massage, and um, this was after about two or three months. And he said, lie down and I'll, you know, have a go at your back. And it was quite a strange feeling touching the f ground, <laughs> lying down on the ground. Because if you haven't been horizontal for a long time, it's, uh, it feels a bit odd. But, uh, mm. you, you do get used to it. Take it, that's the... There are reasons for doing it, of course. Yeah. There it's are. not for torture. No. <laughs> so so what, are, what are the reasons? The reasons are, um, when you lie flat... You could try it, actually. Uh -huh. when, if you lie flat at night, you go into very deep sleep. And if you sit up and sleep, actually your mind doesn't go into such deep sleep. Mm. So this is very good, um, especially later on when there are practices to do with dream. Um, so you don't really, it's not something in a retreat situation you want to encourage going into a very heavy sleep. So that's, that's I would say that's yeah. the reasoning. You want to encourage being able to practice um, even in sleep. In the dream, yeah. really. Mm -hmm. Dream practice, dream yoga. Right. Yeah. And the term retreat, when Tibetan tam means boundary. And it's again relating to creating some sort of external boundary for your mind so that you, you're more aware of your own mind. Yeah. For four years, it's quite tough, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you mentioned the sessions before. Um, what, and, uh, yeah, what, what does go on in the sessions? You will do one particular practice all during the day in each of those sessions for, say, three months. Um, and then there will be a different practice to do, a, a different guru yoga or a different deity practice, um, something like that. And it'll involve um, chanting to, to start with, or reading through a text, um, and then you get to the meditation part, and there's um, usually some mantra recitation to be done. And then um, a visualization uh, incorporated with that. And then dissolution of the visualization, uh, meditation, um, sort of free-form meditation in a sense. Um, and then concluding prayers from that. And the idea being that you, you try to take um, uh, the experience of that meditation with you into um, the, the, the outside life, the out, outside the box sort of life. Yeah. Um, that's how it goes. Yeah. It sounds dull, but it's not at all. It's very, mm. really enjoyable. I think <laughs> it's quite important as well when yeah. people, even just not having done retreat, but even just as a nun, people often say, um, now, aren't you running away from something? Mm. Um, but really, practically, if you sit still, you're not running away. Mm. And people are running all over the world, back and forwards, on planes, keeping mm. busy, quick, let me give another newspaper, right, read it's that one here. Really. Yeah. So mm. just to know that, mm. that, that, that just the basics <coughs> of it mm. is, is if you sit, mm. how can you be running? It's the toughest mm. thing to do. It's very mm. tough. I mean, you really see how your mind wants to do that. You know, yeah. anything becomes interesting, like if one letter comes in on a stamp. <laughs> you think, fascinating, so you read everything or, mm. you know. Mm. And you really see how the mind, the tendencies, you've taken away the objects that they can get, uh, you know, absorbed in. Mm. But the mind's tendencies are there, so you can see it. It's like this mirror. We were saying about the mm. teacher being the mirror. If you take away the objects, you haven't got the TV, the papers, um, you know, ways to distract your mind from actually it's what it is and how it is, then you're left with the mind tendencies and you really can see them very, very clearly yeah. in that sort of situation, can't you? You said um, that it wasn't running away from things, but at the same time, you, the, what motivated you to, well, I, from, from what you said, I, I imagine that what motivated you to go on the retreat was losing somebody who is very close to you. Um, 
And I can't imagine, I mean, you know, that's the worst thing in the world and mm -hmm. for me. And, and I, I, I can't imagine, you know, what do you do when that happens? Do you, you know, you move to another country, you do, you, you have to change. The idea of walking around in the same, in the same um, way that you were before you lost somebody. This is mm -hmm. a very long-winded question, but, uh, but I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm following my train of thought if nobody else is. Yeah. Um, you know, if somebody loses some, somebody, yes. then they move to somewhere where there's no um, associated memories and so on. Mm. So I take it that was a motivating factor. No, not really, no. I, I, I would have been quite suspicious of my motivation um, if that was it. In Buddhism, every, every session, every, every prayer begins with uh, the refuge of saying, you know, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. And then the bodhicitta um, uh, motivation, which is um, that you, you're doing this, your Buddhist practice, um, for eventually the enlightenment of all beings, not just humans, but all beings everywhere, all planets, the whole universe. And that motivation is, your practice won't be terribly valuable unless there is that motivation, um, because that widens it. Um, otherwise, it's just something you do, you know, for yourself, um, and that's selfish Buddhism. Selfish, yeah. Did the bereavement come up during the during, during the retreat anyway? Yeah, for yeah, quite a while. Yeah, you, you re, well, you regurgitate everything. Right. Everything that's in your mind um, comes comes up. Regrets. Um, uh, yeah, just everything. Joyful occasions too. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be sitting in your box. You know, getting very happy, but it's quite false. Uh, uh, that's part of the point of sitting in a box is 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 to get through all these mm -hmm. things and and try to recognise the true nature of your mind. Touching on that um, up and down kind of joy and sadness, in a way, it seems that in um, like modern life at the moment, whatever that is, there's this tendency to seek that. It's like almost like this is the excitement of life. I want up. I want down. There's people think, well, wouldn't you be boring if you just had a balanced, level mind? Mm. But there's a basic misunderstanding mm. in that, that if your motivation is to mm. want to help people, mm. you know, you have to be balanced to be able to do that. Mm. You can't be saying, oh, no, I feel awful today, can't help you, sorry. You know, no, I feel too good to stop and think about what you need. Um, Most of us want drama, mm. not yeah. dharma. <laughs> <laughs> and dharma is quite the opposite of drama. Yeah, I think the mm -hmm. type of people you see attracted to spiritual things in general, particularly about Buddhism, you, you don't see the um, people that may be successful, have money, attractive, whatever. They, they're so busy running around, to, as we said before. Um, it normally takes some quite unique or individual stories like which we have some particular question or turning or something. It there's some interesting aspect or story f from everyone who's a practitioner which motivates them. But the, but, um, the Buddha's life, in a way, though, is the ultimate sort of example of somebody, and apparently he was really physically beautiful, he had absolutely everything, yeah, palace, beautiful. beautiful wife, lovely child, blah, blah, blah. Um, and in a way, and that can lead people, that. yeah, that yeah. can lead people to think, well, I've hmm. got everything I'm supposed to be so made happy by. I mean, don't, don't you think that, like, when we're talking about death and losing someone, these things, actually, we all have to deal with. I mean, death, all of us, you're very, <laughs> for a start, we're all going to die. I mean, that's, that's there, we're all going to die. But also, most of us will experience the loss of someone close, I would say all of us. And if that, that experience, which is very painful, um, can be sort of um, transformed or changed. I mean, to me, I think death really makes things very clear. Mm -hmm. It's a great clarity. It brings you right down. You think, why am I building all these sandcastles when I'm going to die? So what is really important in life? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. personally, my own, my own experience, like from loss, um, when someone close has died, for me, I really felt there was the pain, but also there is the teaching mm -hmm. that everything is impermanent. So when you're grasping, this comes back to your sort of illusory nature of things, the dreamlike nature of things. Mm -hmm. When you're grasping at things as being real, or the, you know, the strength of one's attachment to the person will be, you know, the power of the suffering. And there's a real truth in that. 
And when someone, you know, so close dies, then it, for me, it's really, mm. what is Thanks important? Yeah. What, what are you going to use yeah. your life for? I, I would agree that um, the fact of losing somebody, um, and in, in that sense of, of um, thinking, making you think very closely about death, mm. that um, is, is a good impetus for mm. um, retreat or, mm. or spiritual work, mm. whatever. Yeah. Um, but in the sense of running away or, or just being so upset and, and yeah. you know, yeah. that didn't come into it at yeah. all. But the fact of, you know, there's a dead body and, and this is somebody who you're, you're very uh, close with um, and now it's just cold, um, it, it is quite a good impetus. Um, I mean, one of the basic, as we know, in the things in Tibetan Buddhism is, is to meditate on impermanence and death. Um, well, one of the things so that uh, Buddhism um, stresses is that um, happiness is also suffering, <laughs> in the sense that it's um, impermanent and that uh, it creates a lot of attachment. So um, it leads to suffering, inevitably, and that uh, nirvana is beyond those extremes of both happiness and suffering. Mm -hmm. Happiness is, is one of one of the is the positive side of that duality. I think as well the the um, point about impermanence and, and death maybe is something um, I've heard a Tibetan Lama say that one of the reasons in the West the, the lifestyle that we lead tends to increase the amount that people suffer when they come across the very natural process of dying. Because everything mm -hmm. we're doing now um, in a modern life is somehow trying to deny the natural processes of life. So even day turning to night, there are very subtle but very normal reminders in nature. When you walk on earth, it gets hard in the winter and it's softer in the spring. If you walk on tarmac, it's always the same. The lights are always on. Um, you buy anti-wrinkle cream, stop, get rid of the grey hair, do anything you can to cover this idea that things change and people die. So the suffering becomes immense and then it becomes unbearable. Mm. Um, so people are usually running away from it mm. before it's happened. <laughs> so everybody's life is living in fear. So whether it's before or after an event, it's, it's a constant life of fear. What I'm really interested in, Charles, is what happened when you got out of these two retreats after eight or nine years and um, how you met the uh, Lama who is now your teacher? Um, I got a phone call and said, you know, can you go to India? Um, there's a Tibetan who's come out of Tibet. He's only got three months out, a uh, permit for three months. And uh, can you go very quickly um, to get some instruction? He's offering to uh, give some instruction um, on some practices that um, the lineage has been lost to a certain extent. Uh, has to do with fasting, uh, the Chulin um, lineage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what is not that? In, uh, sorry, it, it, it's extracting, uh, Chu is essence and Len is taking, so it's extracting the essence. It's a way of uh, uh, meditation w without uh, eating. Um, it's it's a, a method that uh, yogis and mountains quite uh, like to use because um, the unavailability of food um, and it purifies the uh, subtle body, yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah, there's five parts to the Chulen practice. Um, it gets sort of progressively more advanced to where you're doing without uh, food or water um, uh, for quite long periods of time. Uh, he just taught um, the initial one, the initial two. The uh, first one is um, just using water and um, a, a pill, um, one pill a day. And you might do that for weeks on end. Um, the second one was um, actually consuming rocks, um, ground up rock, um, and using that, extracting the essence through meditation, uh, deriving your, your energy uh, from that. And he wasn't willing to teach any further. He said, you go away and do more of this. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. And he'd gone out for a walk in the evening with uh, two or three others. And he, uh, he just stopped at this, um, there was some like, small boulders there and said there's a terma in that rock. A terma means treasure um, and there's a tradition in Tibetan Buddhism of 
um, treasures, texts or objects being found from previous times that have a particular revel relevance to now. Um, and when these treasures, the terma, is um, hidden um, at the time, it's, uh, it's also sort of got a, uh, a protection on it um, that the, the right person at the right time finds this, um, because otherwise um, it's not there, so to speak. These things manifest at a particular... Um, the, the being who, uh, who supposedly hides... This is one explanation of terma, and there are yeah. um, more uh, sort of esoteric ones, I suppose. Um, anyway, he said that there was a terma inside the rock, so the bulkiest fella there picked it. It was a sort of lozenge shaped about that size, and he took it down to a um, uh, cave... Uh, and uh, that's a cave sacred to Guru Che. And uh, he said he was going to do a retreat with it for a week um, without drinking or eating at the same time and uh, see what happened. And what usually happens what, to manifest a terma is a cord is tied round, if it's in rock, is tied round it and a, a, blessed, a blessing cord. And hopefully, eventually, the, the rock will if it's the right time and the right place and the right person's discovered it, it'll crack open and whatever is, is inside there. I, I looked at the rock before he started the retreat. Um, there were no cracks. It was, um, it was complete. After, I think on the sixth day, um, it, it just wouldn't crack with this string tied around it and it, you know, nothing was happening. And he was sort of, as he described it, was sort of giving up um, in a way and thought, you know, maybe it's just not right. Um, and then he got this idea that, uh, this vision that, you know, to pursue, carry on with prayers to Guru Mache Padmasambhava. And he did. And the, the, the rock did open. Um, it, uh, like a piece cracked off it. I have pictures of it. And inside um, there was a text about that size, a Tibetan text of folios, um, pages in strips like that, because originally they were printed from um, carve, carving, and to carve something it had to be um, the shape of the wood, and Tibetan trees were not that big. And, um, and also four objects inside, um, sort of embedded un underneath um, the, the, uh, the text. Uh, and they seem to be particularly symbolic um, in, in shape. The, um, there was a round one, a square one, a semicircular and a triangular, and they have particular symbolism for uh, Buddha activity. The round is peaceful, the square is increasing, the semicircular is powerful, and the triangular is uh, wrathful activity. So this is quite an event. Uh, this is a term I find. There's a, there's a a text uh, in a rock. Um, how did the text and the objects get inside the rock? How did he know they were in the rock? And how did the rock crack open to reveal them? It's, I mean, it's non-scientific. <laughs> and what was yeah. the text? Um, You're it, translating it now, aren't you? Yes. Well, not, no. Um, not at his request not translating but transcribing it at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's handwritten um, and so using computer to uh, transcribe it. It works out, it was in very sort of, it's almost a code, succinct sort of form. Um, for instance, um, uh, there, there might be a phrase like four ways of changing the mind, uh, a couple of words, and then when, when that's expanded it's 200 pages. Uh, in, in the expanded, he expanded it. Mm. Um, I had to go back to Tibet a year later and it wasn't ready and then the following year again and it was ready that time. It ends up at about uh, 700 pages, yeah. folios. Yeah. Sometimes these terms come through dreams. Or yeah. You can find them in spaces, different ways, mm. different types. Can the, sorry, about, can I oh, just mm. carry on? There's a bit more to come. Yeah. Uh, so people coming in, some kind of, it's like a miracle, yes. Um, and he says um, he's sitting on this, the, the cave is very damp, sort of. Uh, so he's sitting on this camp bed um, and he's singing his songs sometimes. He sings yogi songs occasionally. 
And then he says, um, I feel a fire in my heart. Um, I feel like making a footprint. Um, and so, uh, you know, where shall I do it? <laughs> and they look down on the floor and it's just a mess, you know, not a mess, but it's, it's sort of uh, pebbles and so forth. And somebody said, oh, look, there's a bit of rock on the wall. So he just leans over with his foot and puts it <laughs> into rock. And it goes in um, a bit more than a centimetre. And it's, it's very, very well defined. Um, it's, I, I was a woodcarver f for a long time, and so I know about carving a bit. Um, it's not carved. It's like if you just took a, your foot and put it into soft clay, um, the, the detail is there in between the toes and the, the, wall, the walls on the foot and so forth. And he was delighted because he'd done it with his left foot in Tibet and now he'd done it with his right foot in India. <laughs> <laughs>